welcome to the English with Kirsty podcast from www.englishwithkirsty.com. Here I'll be sharing with you tips, information and other learning resources so that you can improve your business English. Welcome to episode 175 of the English with Kirsty podcast. And today I've got something a bit different for you because I think it's nice to have other voices apart from just mine. So I have a conversation. Um, it's more of a conversation than an interview. I did have some questions, but we ended up talking about all kinds of things in relation to language and language learning, language teaching, um, language in general. So I, I was talking to Gabriel Clark and he'll introduce himself when we when we get onto the conversation but um, this conversation did get quite long so I've broken it into two parts so this is the first part and it does end quite abruptly but that's because um, we were in the middle of the conversation so here when it ends it will begin immediately afterwards in the next part so um, that's why the we, we stop where we do because um, then in the next part we'll move on to the next question but that will be next week so if you want to have a look at the show notes and to we, we mention a link to one of Gabriel's episodes. So if you want to see that, you have to go to the show notes page, which is englishwithkirsty.com slash podcast slash episode 175. So I hope you enjoy this and the second part will be coming next week. Welcome to the podcast, Gabriel. I'm glad you could make it today. And thanks hey. for joining me. Thanks, Kirsty. It's good to be here. Okay, well, I, I mentioned to you to anyone who reads my newsletter, they'll know about your new podcast because I put it in the mm -hmm. newsletter. Um, but maybe for anyone else, you could tell us a bit about who you are, what you do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Okay, so I'm Gabriel Clark. I'm the Clark in Clark and Miller. So um, we run a, a sort of website that uh, has a blog with lots of free sort of English lessons covering all sorts of areas, sort of grammar, vocab, learning strategies, that sort of thing. As you just mentioned, we've recently uh, launched a podcast, um, which again does sort of lesson-y stuff, but it also does sort of interviews with teachers, language experts, and that sort of thing. So we have a sort of two-tier thing happening where it's like lots of stuff just to learn English, but then there's lots of stuff to get under the skin of language and language teaching. Um, yeah, I, I'm a teacher, I'm a teacher trainer. I do a lot of writing. I'm just a general language geek, I, I suppose. Um, yeah, linguistics, language, teaching, that whole area, anything I can get my hands on um, with that, I, I do. <laughs> Yeah, I think that there are quite a few podcast listeners who will relate to that, you know, like whether they're mm -hmm. language learners or just generally interested in languages. I've mm. certainly always been interested in them. Um, which languages do you speak or which languages are you learning? Well, OK, so um, I'm actually quite a, uh, a reluctant language learner, I'll confess. Um, but I, I've learned Turkish um, to a pretty high level. Um, and I've got smatterings of like... Yeah, a smattering of Bulgarian and a, a, a lesser smattering of, of Russian as well. But really just the only the basics. It's Turkish that I, I really took up to like a, a, a proper communicative level. And why were you, what was your motivation for that? Why were you interested in, in Turkish? Oh, uh, because I was living there. <laughs> and yeah, that helps. <laughs> it's pretty, yeah. I, it's... It was pretty, it was a pretty strong motivator. Um, yeah, it's a country, it's not like, uh, it's not like going to the Netherlands. A lot of people don't speak um, English. Lots of people do, but a lot of people don't. And um, also, you know, if you're living in a country, you've got to learn the language to some level. Um, mm. And yeah, I just, I really took it far with Turkish. I got really into it and I, I, I got to quite a high level. Um, it felt good when I was sort of realized I was better than most of my friends who were also learning it and it felt good and that motivated me to, to do it even more <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah and how did yeah. you find that people responded to you um you know when when you showed them that you could mm. communicate in turkish did, did that help you to to make friends or to do business or uh yeah certainly um do you mean turkish people yeah native or speakers turkish or first other language people speakers in, in yeah yeah 
Uh, mix, I think it's interesting. Most people are sort of quite impressed uh, because, you know, they're not used to hearing people speak Turkish well. Um, mm. uh, occasionally, I don't know, sometimes <laughs> Turks, Turks, like a lot of people in Turkey can be very like honest and direct uh, about certain things. So um, if you're having a bad day, you know, when you're having a bad language day and you, you mm. can't get your, your thoughts out properly and you're just, you know, you're just, some days you're good at your second language and some days you're not as good as you usually are. And if you're having a bad day, some, I've had people just say, oh, your Turkish is very weak. Um, <laughs> and things okay. like that. Yeah, it's like, okay, a bit rude, but that's okay. <laughs> it's only rude for me. It's a cultural thing that um, he was just being honest. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, it helps. It helps make friends a lot, but I found it very easy to make friends anyway. It's a, it's a very friendly place. Um, um, I wasn't actually doing business at the time. I was just sort of working. It helped me with my lessons though. As a teacher, it gave me a lot of, um, a lot of leverage, I think. Um, not in a negotiating way, but in, a, in the sense that I understood what kind of mistakes my students were making. Uh, I understood sort of the reasons they were making mistakes that would have otherwise have seemed like illogical. Um, and also when you're in a classroom of like 15 or 20 or 25, uh, <laughs> um, students, and especially if it's a lower level, there'll be a lot of Turkish speaking going on and you can sort of, uh, you know, if you understand what they're saying, even if you've decided not to use the language in the classroom, um, you can still understand what they're saying and you can still be kind of involved and, it reduces the barrier between the teacher and the students. And that's quite valuable because you want to be as close to the students in an intellectual like way um, as possible. Mm. So that, that helps for that too. Yeah, I think some of the psychology as well, you know, like um, both for understanding the students and for content, if you're someone who writes blogs or, or does podcasts, like for, for me, some of my ideas mm. for episodes have come from things that have happened to me as a learner um mm. things that i've learned you know what do you do if somebody is unkind about your english because <laughs> i you know, <laughs> generally people are, are i i deal mainly with with german speakers and generally people are very complimentary but sometimes um as you say it's always when you're having a bad day and then someone picks up on it and makes your day even worse but you know what do you do about that how do you how do you turn it around and certainly being a learner um i, I think enables us to understand how mm. learners feel at times yeah. when, when things maybe aren't going so well. I think that's really vital. Um, you know, you, yeah, I, yeah, this sort of being a good teacher requires a lot of empathy, I think. Mm. And if you've gone through the struggle of, of learning a second language to, to a reasonable level, you can then easily empathize with your students. And that, I think will just make you a better teacher. It'll make you more patient as well for a start. Um, but also you, you, you have an appreciation for the struggles they're going through too. And that's, that's good. <laughs> that, that helps you uh, improve and, and become better. Yeah, I think there's a caution with that, that you, you mm. certainly understand people who learn in the way that you do. Um, for me, that is mm. being fairly good at reading and writing and listening and hating spontaneous speaking and, and needing to push through that so I I need to remind myself that not everybody feels like that and there are some people who absolutely love speaking and, and hate listening tasks mm. and you know like to try and keep the balance that you can really empathize with people who think as you do but also there are other issues and challenges going on that you may not be as aware of in your own experience that's a really good point isn't it yeah it's easy to um to sort of uh, project uh, your own experience onto others when they're having a, a different one. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's true. But, but generally, yeah, I, I have never lived in Turkey, but um, through, I, I speak Turkish as well, and um, mm -hmm. I've, I've let it lapse. Um, and I'm trying to do something about that at the moment, but I've always had a really a, amazed kind of response. Generally, if people don't expect English people generally to, to speak Turkish and so mm -hmm. people have been quite positive about that um, um, maybe not as used to hearing other people trying to, to speak um, their native language and I think as an English speaker you especially if you're living 
or have lived somewhere like London, you hear lots of different varieties of English and that, that's great. Um, whereas with some other language, people only really hear kind of native speaker or, or not. Obviously, there are different levels mm. of, of education or different ways of expressing yourself. But um, yeah, I, I think that can be kind of funny if somebody makes a mistake and oh you said that when it's not actually that funny I just made a mistake <laughs> and that's, that's a challenge for language learners mm. but yeah I think generally people are very positive if you try because a lot of I don't know holiday makers and don't try very much you know go to another country and don't even learn thank you please and I think people are generally quite happy when when you do I think there are some, yeah, <laughs> some people are more guilty of it than others. Yeah, it's true. Um, and I want, have you ever, have you found that um, speaking your second language in the country where it, where it's from, so speaking German in Germany or speaking Turkish in Turkey is a, a sort of different experience than speaking outside that country. Like when I'm speaking Turkish in Bulgaria or in England, I find it a lot less stressful and I feel there's a lot less pressure on me because I'm using it as a sort of lingua franca. So the rules, the expectations are not as high. Um, and you have a sort of sense of solidarity with the person you're speaking with. Whereas when you're in the country, where it's widely spoken, it's just such a normal thing. So you're kind of up against everyone else. Does that make sense? That's an interesting way to look at it. I haven't mm. thought about it like that because I always put myself under a ridiculous amount of pressure wherever <laughs> I'm going to speak it. And then, mm -hmm. and even if I know that the person speaks English, I will, I will struggle to the, <laughs> to the bitter end to try and get this, this <laughs> thing communicated in Turkish. Um, mm -hmm which isn't a good way to be but yeah it's, it's true like if you, if you know there's a much higher chance that the person will understand you that you don't need to feel as much under pressure yeah um but most of what i've done with turkish is is after i went to turkey so i haven't actually uh -huh. been back to turkey since i started learning so maybe and then maybe yeah. go into the deep and find somewhere where there are no english speakers because uh that's a really good mm -hmm. way to learn. <laughs> I had a, a German friend when I began learning German who didn't speak any English. Um, I think she may have had some at school, but it was a while ago and she'd forgotten it and yeah. didn't really like it very much anyway. So um, we couldn't communicate in English. And even as a beginner learner, that was really good for me because I knew I had to try. Um, it's too easy to slip back into English if, if things are getting difficult. But I knew that if, if I didn't try to explain this thing in German or to use other words, if I didn't know mm -hmm. the ones I needed, we would just be sitting there drinking our coffee in silence and it would be a Absolutely. really rubbish friendship. So, <laughs> yes. yeah. Oh, yeah, that's, a, that's putting yourself under immense pressure. And I know. <laughs> yeah, I take my hat off, you. hat off to you for that because that's not easy. Yeah, that really is not easy. No. But, but cool. Yeah, it makes you it makes you think, it makes you learn. Yeah. yeah. So in terms mm -hmm. of tips then, could you could you give mm -hmm. us three tips or three things that have helped you to, to learn a language, to develop a certain skill, things that, that you learned and that would help others? Yeah, yeah. Uh, all of these relate to language learning for sure. Um, I got three. I got one that was very quite specific for me, but it, if it works as well, for other people as it did for me, then I'm gonna recommend it for sure. One's a, a, a typical cliche example, but there's a cliche for a reason and there's something else that's a bit more uh, independent. So <laughs> uh, okay. the first tip, <laughs> I'm introducing the tips. Um, the first tip is reading Tintin for me um, was a tremendous help. I, I don't think anything, well, apart from, you know, just being in the country and communicating with people, but in terms of, sort of self-study in terms of things I had control over. Reading Tintin was maybe as much help for me as almost everything else put together. Um, I don't know what it was. I just, I love Tintin. It was something I'm kind of passionate about. I've, I was brought up on Tintin and it's conversational, um, but it's not too informal like a lot of other like comics and graphic novels can be. Uh, so you know, when language gets very informal, it gets quite difficult. So if you're at sort of pre-intermediate or intermediate level, um, you may not be quite prepared for like deeply informal language. Um, so Tintin kind of doesn't, doesn't really go there. 
Um, yeah, and I, for me, being able to see what's happening as well, like to take the pressure off as well. And I could sort of relate what's happening and what's being said a bit more. And I picked up so much. I picked up so much vocabulary. I picked up so much grammar um, and just, you know, phraseology as well. Just um, there are so many grammatical structures and words and phrases that I, I know now very well in Turkish, but whenever I use them, I'm straight back into that Tintin book. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, that's Tintin and the, and the Black Island. Um, so it reminds you it's, it's something that makes sense or is relevant to you so it helps it to, to keep in your brain when you need it next time yeah yeah because we learn best when we with well we only learn really through association learning is just a a, a, a complex process of, of making associations with things and yeah tintin just gave me very strong associations and was that things that you'd read before in english or was it new material but that you know you you, you knew you liked it um, mm -hmm. Do you mean Tintin generally or like the book, the specific ones, the specific books I was reading? The specific ones you read in Turkish, had you already read them in English before or was it new in, in that? Some, some of them were new, some of them weren't. It was, a, it was okay. a mishmash. It was about what I could find and what I could get my hands on. I was, a, I was it was down to what was around. Uh, they didn't have, I couldn't just get like any Tintin book. So yeah, I just got one whenever I could. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, if, I, mm -hmm. I just yeah. say if, if for other people it isn't that, I mean, I, I can't really talk about um, comics and graphic novels because course, I can't yeah. read them. But mm -hmm. I mean, if that is definitely a, a good tip that I've never used before on this podcast, because most of what I talk about is from my experience. But yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that's really good. If, um, and I, I guess it kind of breaks up the text as well. It's not like a massive block of text because you've got the images as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's what helps it. And it, it, it I think it lowers the effective filter. It makes you a little less anxious because you're in this sort of world that is sort of quite comforting. And yeah, I mean, visuals aside, it might also just be a, a deep sense of nostalgia um, that, that was also making it really easy for me to, to get through a lot of material. Your childhood. Um, like... Yeah. 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 So maybe, maybe, Another tip or a part of that tip is finding stuff that sort of um, might trigger childhood emotions and, and associations because that can be very comforting. And if you're comforted, you less stress and you might learn more. Also, it's a sense of fun, isn't it? If you think about mm. something that you naturally find enjoyable or think will be fun, then you'll probably absorb more because you're more open to, to learning. Mm. less stressed or thinking oh this is really boring i want to go and do something else <laughs> <laughs> yeah i did try a few things that i shouldn't have started reading <laughs> they were very boring yeah um okay. sorry yeah so that was the first tip uh the second tip um okay this is the cliche tip and it's i think it's a cliche for a very good reason you've already demonstrated it today because you were talking about your friend who um didn't speak any english and you were talking about um, going to some random part of Turkey where nobody speaks English. So be exposed to the language. <laughs> it's just, mm. it's so obvious, but it can't not be one of the main tips because it's just so important. Um, and it, 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 it's, it's, it's a bit strange to say it, that it needs to be said, but I have seen people, um, you know, my own students with, awful, awful self-study strategies where they're kind of isolating the vocabulary and isolating the grammar and learning things in a very mathematical sort of way. And, you know, just learning rules and then lists, rules mm. and lists. And it's like, that's not how a language works. And you're, you're not going to get far like that way. You're not going to have a very functional um, uh, ability, uh, function, you won't be able to use the language to a very functional level. So you, the, really the only way you can do that is just to be exposed, reading and listening a lot. Yeah, and, and now it's easier than ever for us to do that. I mean, you can, because we have the internet, mm. whatever language you're learning, you'll probably be able to find some resources without even leaving your house. I mean, certainly a lot of us have some travel restrictions at the moment and even if you don't if, if you're trying to learn where you've got a job and other responsibilities you may not be able to go and 
spend an extended period of time in the country, but there's so much material mm. now that you can access. Yeah, and not only will you find something in the language you're learning, but you'll probably find something that suits you in the language you're learning. Not just a random text or a random like audio, but there's so much on the internet that you might find something you're, you're interested in mm. as well as it being, yeah, as well as it being just there and available. Yeah, that's one of my uh, things that I go on about a lot in this podcast, you know, find mm -hmm. things that interest you because then you, you will be more willing to spend time working with them. Or, you know, if, it's, mm. if you ask me to read text about football, I wouldn't even enjoy it in English, so I'm not going to enjoy it in another language. <laughs> but if you get something I'm interested in and care about, then I will, I will be a lot more committed to that. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah. And that's the other thing, isn't it? Like so many people say that you can learn English in a week or, you know, spend five minutes a day and, and you'll have amazing language skills but none of that is true and if you want to be good at a language you're going to have to put the work in and there it's not easy some days are better than others but you, you have to stick at it and and that's more likely to happen if, if you're finding materials that you you want to be yeah. reading or listening to yeah and that slightly at a bit of a jump brings me to the third one I <laughs> <The third laughs> you. Sorry. <laughs> oh no, it's good. It's good. Um, it's like a, it's a nice segue. Um, yeah, I think again, it's sort of related to self study. But like, yeah, my tip would be don't be rigid with your self study plan. Like, um, you don't know what you're going to want to do on Wednesday on Monday. <laughs> so <laughs> you might you might have a nice. I've, I've seen study plans fall apart within days because people sort of nicely organize like their week ahead and their weeks ahead and even months ahead. Um, wow. And I mean, it's, it's great that people are organized, but like you can be setting yourself up for a fall if you do that. You could be, um, you know, sort of, it can be very, very demotivating to to create this sort of prison of <laughs> of, uh, of a schedule. Um, what I tend to recommend to people is to basically make a, a, a list or a menu of things that they um, they like doing. Like every time they discover something that they like doing, that's a studying thing, um, reading Tintin or like listening to a five minute English thing. Um, put it in their menu so like every day they can just consult their menu and you're more most people being human are more likely to um procrastinate and decide not to study today i'll do it tomorrow uh if the thing they have to do today is something they don't want to do and it's always good to do something no matter what it is it's, i mean it's always better than doing nothing Mm. whatever it is, is always better than doing nothing. If it's two minutes of listening to something really, really, really easy, okay, it's not going to help you a massive amount, but better than if you were doing nothing. Um, I know that that sort of raises questions because, you know, we still have to have, we still need to have a sort of balance between the skills, between reading and writing and listening and speaking. And um, you still need to sort of juggle that. But I still think that doing something that you're motivated to do is, and, and you're enjoying doing, is going to do you more favors than doing something that isn't. Yeah, so, and it's like, yeah. um, you did an episode about that, didn't you? So we can oh, put yeah. the direct link in to that. Yes, um, oh yeah, did I publish that already? <laughs> yeah, <Okay. laughs> well, I'm just doing that. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, that gives some, some more examples of things that you can do, I guess. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be like the child who leaves the vegetables till last and doesn't eat them because they eat all the good stuff. But yeah, oh, good, I, I agree with you. Good that... metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I agree that, yeah, you, you should definitely do something. And, and variety is good because people get really bored doing the same old stuff, don't they? So mm -hmm. yeah, if you can have like a, a, you go to the shop and or go to the, the restaurant and decide what's on the menu that you fancy, you're going to fancy different yeah. things on different days. So yeah, I like that analogy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's it's easier to motivate yourself to go and look at a long list of things and choose one of them, any of them, than go and look at a piece of paper that's telling you what to do. Unless you have an exam. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are, 
this is a very sort of free spirited um, piece of advice. And yeah, there may be lots of exceptions where you, you actually just need to do what the paper tells you to do. <laughs> yeah. But I like the freedom of that. And I think that's a good thing mm. about um, self-study particularly um, mm. that you are really in charge. You may have had to go through books when you were at school and you've got the syllabus and you have to do everything on the syllabus, but really you are in charge when you're studying on your own and you can choose what direction that goes in and what you want to explore. And mm. I think it's, it's exciting. It can be because you're putting together your syllabus for the next weeks or month, whatever it is. And, you know, hopefully doing what you said in the first tips as well, like finding something that's, that's relevant mm. and interesting for you mm. and also exposing yourself to, to real language because that's where you're going to learn you may also find some mistakes because not every native speaker speaks without mistakes, do they? You know, you may find mm -hmm. some things that are not like in your, your course books where everything is 100% perfect or, but also you'll find that language is a living thing and it's, it's yeah. changing and there are new expressions coming in and old ones are becoming less popular and you won't know that unless you find some real language being used. Yeah, that's a very good point. Things that used to be considered mistakes are, are now no longer considered mis mistakes, for example. That's the major part of change that I quite enjoy. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a living beast. <laughs> it is, it is living, living language, livingenglish.com. Nobody's, nobody's got that um, domain name yet. That's still, that's still available. Snap it up. <laughs> <laughs>